In the midst of a very challenging year, we as a church made sure to stay on point, to stay on mission with Jesus to impact our world. Irregardless of what we were walking through, we made sure that we stayed focused on the mission, which is the gospel. And today, we're going to look at the last part of that, Luke chapter 2. Go on and get your Bibles, Luke chapter 2. Boys and girls, thank you for being uh, in church today and for sharing with us grown-ups some of the most meaningful parts of Christmas. Today, Luke chapter 2, we're going to talk about really one of my favorite pieces of the Christmas story. Um, we're going to talk about the manger because I think the manger for us today as people, as grown-ups, uh, it really draws us in to how Jesus was born, where Jesus was born, and, and what truly means the most for us as we all move ahead. Luke chapter 2. And so today, yes, we're going to read some of the verses that we have read um, but I really think that the heart of this Christmas story um, lies in part of what we'll read today. So Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 14. We've read it before, but I want to read this part again. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields. And they were keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among people, men and women with whom he is pleased. Let me pray for us today. Father, I ask that on this last Sunday of December of this Christmas season, that what your word shows us today will therefore set us up to experience your presence with us in the year ahead. I pray for all of your children today. In Jesus' name, amen. When I, when I look at this story, there, there's a lot that stands out of a great celebration. There are the angels. We see that. Um, there are all of these moments of celebration. But, but when I really begin to look at the story, the major players in the story of Christmas at the birth of Christ, they were all very humble people. They were people of humble backgrounds. They were people of, of humble jobs. They were people of, of humble experience. They were not the flashy. They were not those with the power. They were not those with something to prove. When you look at Jesus, who he was born to, who was there, what happened, it's a very humble experience. And I believe for us today, as we finish one very challenging year and as we prepare for another, which, by the way, just because the calendar flips in a few days to day one of a new year, it doesn't mean anything changed. <laughs> we still have to battle. We still have things that we must overcome. But how do you do that? How do you face that? Well, I, I think this last part that we'll look at today um, of this Christmas story will help us move forward because the people that were there were humble. Have you been humbled in this process? Have you been broken in some capacity through this season of life? Have you drawn closer to God because of what you've seen? Because the Christmas story is all about humble people drawing closer to God. And the humble people are the ones who will draw closer to God. Not those with pride. It's those who are broken that will draw closer with God and they will experience life change. But those who do not experience humility before a manger, before a king, then life will not change. Things will continue to roll on and they will miss the wonderful gifts 
that we have talked about this year. Let me give you the life lesson, and I want to show you four gifts and three people today. What, Pastor Michael, seven points? I promise it won't go 70 minutes. I promise. Because I know that it's Christmas and we have to go short. But there are four gifts that I see, four blessings. And today, I want to talk to you about the meaningful blessings. We've been talking about the blessing of Christmas, and we've talked about those things, the people, the gatherings, the gifts. Um, today, I, I want to look at these things very specifically. The life lesson is this, the real blessings in life. And I hope that you've learned that through this season. The real blessings in life, they flow from the simple moments of our heart's humbled before the Lord. The real blessings in life, they flow from the simple moments where our hearts will be humble before the Lord. And all of this Christmas story reveals to us there were people who in the simplicity of moments of humility, they bowed themselves before the Lord. And that is the key to your success, to my success, to our success moving into 2021. As we finish this Christmas year and we move to the next, it's all about the simple moments where we will allow our hearts to be humbled before the Lord. In this passage, there are four things that I think stand out that the angels tell us that are the gifts that really you don't find much of in the world. They, they, they say to the shepherds, they say, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. And then in the end, they say, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and favor or goodwill to you. So I, I think there are four gifts that only are experienced when your heart is humbled before the Lord. And these are simple gifts. These are simple moments. They are not complicated. Um, perhaps like your gatherings this year. Because I imagine that your gatherings this year with family and friends, though different, they were deeply meaningful. They were deeply personal. You probably cherished them more than you did last year. There were things that probably touched your heart more than they did last year. And these are the types of things that happen when life gets simplified and we get humble. The simple gifts that happen, the simple moments that happen, when we humble our hearts and we bow before the Lord, those gifts are really the most meaningful gifts. Those are the most meaningful blessings. Let's look at the first one. The first one is the gospel. The angel said, I bring you good news of great joy. Good news. Now, you and I, we read that in our English translation. We read it. I bring you good news. But the word is euangelion. That's the word in the Greek in the New Testament. And euangelion, uh, it's easy for us to say good news. But the word actually is gospel. So what they're saying is to the shepherds, I bring you the gospel. Now, the gospel is not a word we understand a lot. We use a lot. But the word gospel it is legitimately the good news in spite of bad news. It's the good news that overcomes bad news. The gospel. And what is the gospel? The angels very clearly at the birth of Christ deliver a message that say, I bring you the gospel. And the gospel is that a Savior was born to rescue us from our sins. That's the gospel. That's the good news. The good news is that Jesus was born to rescue us from our sin. That's gospel. It's not something that we can create. It's not something that we deserve. It is something that God gave. And these angels proclaimed it in the very beginning. I bring you one of the most meaningful gifts that you will ever experience. One of the most meaningful moments that you will ever have. One of the most meaningful blessings of Christmas. And the first one is the gospel. The gospel that Jesus would come to save us when we could not save ourselves. That Jesus would come as good news when our lives were full of bad news. That's a meaningful gift, isn't it? And that's the first one. Then they mention the second gift. I bring you good news of what? Of great what? Of great joy. Now this one is fascinating. Because good news of great joy is not a feeling. <laughs> 
Matter of fact, if you wanted to go back in time for some of you in your favorite group, your favorite song, it's more than a feeling. Joy is way more than a feeling. The reality is many of us during the life prior to going through COVID, we live to experience happiness. And we know that happiness is fleeting. Happiness is a feeling. Joy is not. I bring you good news of great joy. What is great joy if it's not a feeling? What the angels proclaim there that is really one of the most meaningful blessings and meaningful gifts that you and I can hold on to in this season of life. Joy comes from the overwhelming and constant abiding presence of God in your life. Period. That's where joy is found. Joy is not found in this world. It's not found in experiences. It's not found even in the people that are around you. They may make you happy at times, but there are other times where you will not be happy. A gift may make you happy at times, but there are other times where you will not be happy. A job or work may ha make you happy at some point in time, but there are other points where you will not be happy with it. That's happiness. It comes and it goes. But joy remains the same. I bring you good news of great joy. How do you experience joy in the midst of things that are up and down? Good news of great joy knowing that Jesus, as the gospel, has saved you and he is with you no matter what. There is this abiding sense of joy. So when your world is rocked and challenged, when you go through difficulty, God did not let you go. He did not abandon you. He proved it. He sent Jesus. He is with you. And therefore, the ever overwhelming presence of God is on your life. And when you need something to walk you through, someone to walk you through the most challenging moments of your life, he's there for you. And there is this joy, this joy of knowing he's walking with you. He is there with you. He is abiding with you and he will never let you go. That's not a feeling. That's the presence of God constantly in your heart over your life. And the angels say, I bring you the gift of the gospel and of joy. Isn't that good? There's a third gift, they say. At the end of verse 14, we talked about this. This one we talked about a few weeks ago. But it says to us, glory to God in the, eye, in the highest and on earth among you people, peace. Peace. Now, Jesus talked about this when he was older and when he was teaching. You know, He said, the peace that I'm going to give you is not like the peace of the world. There is no peace in this world. I, I think we've learned that in this last year. It's, it's not there. It's not present. It, it's not present in our politics. It's not present even in our jobs. It's not present sometimes in our cultural battles and differences. You don't find peace among people of the world. But if we will pay attention to one of the most meaningful gifts that God gives, you will find peace amongst the children of God saved by Jesus. Peace. Because those are the people that work hard. Not only because they know they are at peace with God, but they want to be at peace with others. They want to be at peace with themselves. They want to acknowledge that there is a gift that this world will not give and cannot give. And the things and the gifts of this world and the things we chase after will not fill in our hearts. But the peace of Jesus, the peace of God, now that's a gift. That's a meaningful blessing that never goes away. I don't know about you, but as I've walked through this year, peace from things out there were hard to find. I mean... I mean, I had to stop watching a lot of things and reading a lot of things because it never brought me peace. But in the silence of my very private moments with Jesus, peace. In the silence of, of what I would share with him and what he would say to me, peace. Peace comes to the children of God saved by Jesus. Peace comes to you, those who are saved by Jesus. And peace is not of this world. It is of Jesus. And that is a meaningful blessing. The angels said glory to God in the highest. And to you, those who believe, the children of God, to all of you, men and women, who believe in this moment that we celebrate at Christmas, the birth of the Savior, you are at peace with God. Isn't that good? 
Gift number three, that's a meaningful blessing. And the last one, number four, and I told you we wouldn't take 70 minutes, right? Number four is favor. Peace and goodwill, which is translated, goodwill is translated favor. God's favor upon you. God's favor upon those who trust in him. God's favor upon those who follow him. God's favor upon those who believe in this son born to save them, Jesus. And the favor of God is beyond deserve. It's like his mercy. It's like his grace. It's like his loving kindness. His favor just comes upon you. It's a gift. It's something to be received, not shunned, not be arrogant about, but to be received. It is a gift that God gives, a meaningful blessing for you this Christmas. God's favor is upon you. God's favor is upon you because he lives in you. He's brought the gospel. He is with you. That is joy. He is someone who has set up peace. Jesus set up peace between us and God. And therefore, we get to live under his favor. Peace and favor to those, look at this, with whom he is pleased. I don't know about you, but I don't always feel like I please God. I don't always spend my time around people who I think God would be pleased with, but that's not about me, and it's not about you. God is pleased when Jesus has come into your life. When you have received the Savior born in the manger at Bethlehem, God's peace and his pleasure, his favor, now rest upon you. It's not about what you have or what you don't have. It's about what's happening in here. Remember the simple gifts, the simple moments, those moments where we are humbled. And all of these gifts can only be received by humble hearts. And that brings me to the three characters. Because in this passage, there are some players. Of course, we know Mary and Joseph, right? We understand that. But in the one we read today, um, they're the shepherds. They're the first group. Three humble settings, the shepherds. Who did the message of the birth of the Savior come to first? Think about it. I mean, we have the recording in Matthew of the wise men, and we understand Herod. But who got to see Jesus after he was born? Well, Caesar Augustus, we hear about him, but he didn't get to see Jesus. We, we hear about Herod. Thank God Herod did not get to see Jesus, right? Um, we understand that they were wise men, but the reality of the tradition is that the wise men showed up probably a little bit later. That's the reality of that story. So who did heaven split to offer the word, this son is born and you need to go see him? Who did it come to first? Shepherds. That's fascinating. And that's something about humility that I think is something we all could learn from as we look ahead. Because it was to a group of people who would spend their lives out of sight, out of mind, doing the right thing to care about others. Isn't that fascinating? That the message of Jesus, hey... The angels would split heaven. Did you see the Christmas star this week, by the way? I mean, now, here's the thing. In New Orleans, it was really hard to see. You had to get outside of the city to be able to see those planets align. And some people think that must be it. That must be the Christmas star. Whether it was or whether it wasn't, uh, I made an effort to see it because it was important to me and I wanted to see it. And, and my daughter Ella and I, we, we hustled and we were like, look, there it is over there. Let's go. And like we drove to this point and, and it's like, there it is. And we got to see it, right? The heavens were aligned. The sun, the moon, the stars were all aligned to point the way. But who did the message come to first? Who got to see it first? Shepherds, those who were out of sight, out of mind, those who spent their time caring for others. And yes, the others, by the way, were sheep. I get that. It's not a royal job, though. I want you to understand that. It's not something that they got to take credit for. They didn't get to post it. They didn't get to say, look at us. They didn't, they didn't use that as something to portray themselves as prideful people. They were humble in every regard. And there's something about humility that allows us to see Jesus. Can I say that again? There's something about humility of heart that allows us 
to see Jesus. And that's what the shepherds were able to do. They were those who would care for others. They were people of simple means. I, I think one of the things that I really love about this church and about you as my family and I really love about the West Bank and I really love about this city as a shepherd, as a pastor, as what I have been asked and called to do. One of the things I really love is that I'm surrounded by other shepherds. I'm surrounded by people who know how to work hard behind the scenes, who don't do it for glory, who struggle, who don't do it for show, who work not only at their jobs, but at their faith, who strive and struggle and who rally together even in most difficult times. I, I, that's one of the things that forever in my life will ever touch me. I've had moments where I've seen others. I've seen other churches. I've seen other people. I've seen, uh, I've seen other places, and I've been there, and I've experienced that. Um, and it looks really good on the outside, but there's no substance to it. What I love about you is the substance of looking in this room today, and for those of you online, the substance of knowing you're like a shepherd. Because it's humble people who strive and struggle, who live with the substance of their heart humbly to follow the Lord and meet the Lord. It's those kind of people that get to see Jesus. And the shepherds are some of the great settings, one of the great settings, some of the great players in this early Christmas story. Um, humble people. There's another group of humble people. You may not recognize this, but they are there um, in the Christmas story. And we read about them today. It's the angels. And the angels actually are people, beings, celestial beings, who are humble. Did you ever think about that? I mean, when we think about angels, we think about, in our culture, um, what's this angel doing to help us? What's this angel doing that we should pray to? People pray to them. Uh, people have a lot of weird beliefs about angels. What's an angel? Who's an angel? People have a lot of thought systems. And I realize some of you may have that as well. But I want to take you to what the Bible says about angels. They are actually some of the most humble creations in all of history and in all of heaven. Uh, if you want to know in the Greek what the word angel means, in the Greek, angelos means messenger. It means messenger. Now, at its very core, that's very important for you and I to understand about the angels because when we read the Christmas story, we think of glory in the highest and wow, these celestial beings and, and fear and awe and wow. But an angel, by very definition, is a messenger. And to be a messenger, just like Gabriel, who brought the message to Mary up front, to be a messenger means that you are humble enough to deliver the message on a part of a higher authority. You cannot be a messenger if you do not have a message to give. And you will not have a message to give unless you are listening to someone higher in authority tell you what to do. And every time you have an angel show up in Scripture, they are a messenger of what God has said is going to happen. That's what they are. Yes, they are powerful. Yes, they are strong. Yes, they are mighty. But at the core of who they are, they are messengers. And to be a messenger... You have to be humble. And if you don't think that's the case, if you did a little theology lesson on what angels are not in heaven, what's the one word that gets an angel and all of his followers kicked out? Pride. Pride. And the whole reason we battle today, don't make a mistake about it. It's not pandemics and it's not governments and it's not the world. The whole reason we battle today is that there are some messengers who decided not to be a messenger. And there are some messengers who decided they were the authority. And so then they used their authority to wreck our lives today, which is sad. But the real angels that showed up in Christmas said there is a message, there is a messenger, there is someone that's going to change all of that. 
There is someone who has the glory, who has the authority. There is someone who is born, and it's not angelic, and it's not something that's going to rock your world. Someone who is born a savior to humble people of humble means, with a humble audience. He is the one who is going to change it all. And that's the message that the messengers, the angels, delivered. Even angels have a humility of a simple moment to announce a simple birth that is life-changing. And what a great lesson for us because not only to see Jesus first do we need humble hearts, but to proclaim Jesus first we need humble hearts. And if the angels can do it, so can you. The Bible even says that when we get there, we will even hold angels to account. Wow. That means humility of heart is so important to proclaim Jesus to those we love and those around us. These messengers on behalf of someone else are the ones who show us humility, hearts humbled before the Lord. And when I see that, I see that there are those who cared for others. There are those who delivered the message on behalf of another. That brings me to the final piece, the third setting. And this perhaps, to me, this year is truly the most meaningful part of the Christmas story. And that is the exact place where Jesus was born and where Mary and Joseph had to place their child. Do you know where they laid him in cloths? In a manger. They laid him in a manger. And this year that resonates with me more than anything else. The Savior was born in a manger. The Savior was not born in the United States of America. The Savior was not born in your political party or mine. The Savior, he was not born because of a job that he did or to a royal bloodline that he would flow from. What helps me understand humility of being able to meet God, to know God, to fear God, to receive peace, gospel, joy, favor, to receive all those things. It's a manger. A manger. It's a place where animals would feed and the Son of God yet was born. And I'm going to tell you that message resonates with me because as I look forward to this new year, I can see that from a manger, there was a real Savior that was born for me. There was a real Savior that was born for you. He wasn't just born for rich people, or white people, or black people, or Chinese people. He wasn't just born for people in power and in government. He wasn't born because you make a lot of money doing your job. He wasn't born because our lives are all put together. No, because he was born in a manger. He breaks down all the barriers, all the bondage, all the challenge, all the difficulty that real people like you and me have to work through every single day. He was a real savior. He wasn't a Republican or he wasn't a Democrat or he wasn't a socialist. He was Jesus, and he was the only one that could bring peace to a world gone haywire. He was the only one that could save a soul that would be consumed by a pandemic. He was the only one that could bring the joy of God to our most difficult, broken of days, to our moments where our hearts ache and our souls question what's going on. It was Jesus, and he was born in a manger. He was born to peasants. Jewish man and a Jewish woman, a woman who had to deal with the scorn of people saying, oh, you're having a child outside of wedlock? Shame on you. Oh yeah, son of God, yeah, heard that one before. That's who he was born to. He wasn't born in a palace. He didn't have a silver spoon. He was just like you, just like me. He was human. 
And the messengers, they proclaimed that. The shepherds, they got to see that. Mary and Joseph, they were there. And it's that setting that reminds me of my identity, of your identity. You see, as we move forward this year, we will fight for work. We will fight for jobs. We will fight in our flesh for all kinds of things. But that's not really who we are. If we humble ourselves in the simplest of moments and we humble our hearts before a Savior born in a manger, that's when life and the most meaningful blessings begin to flow. So my prayer for you this morning as we finish the last Sunday of December 2020 and as we look forward to 2021 may the simple gifts of the gospel be true of your heart may you find the joy of Christ each and every day no matter what may you experience his peace that is beyond any understanding that this world offers and may you rest in the favor of God humbly like a shepherd a messenger like an angel and because you received a savior that was born in a manger a manger for you for me for us let me pray for us father i thank you today for who you are and for what you've done i thank you for a savior Savior, who is not a star, not a politician, not someone popular in the world, not someone striving for an identity that wasn't real. A real Savior, born for real people, who knew what it meant to be humbled by you. God, I pray that the gifts, the blessings of Christmas will flow to each and every person in this room and online. As we humble ourselves, that the simple moments of life will transform us to draw closer to you. And Jesus, I thank you for a manger. I thank you for doing it the right way. You're that kind of God and that kind of Savior. And it's in your name we pray.